And in 1976, during the unmanned mission to Mars, the Viking mission, lo and behold, on frame 35A72, taken on an afternoon on Mars of a northern Martian desert called Sidonia, we, the human race, NASA, the United States of America, the American people who paid for the mission, spotted and noted an enigmatic artifact that did not belong, the so-called face on Mars. Now, many things have happened in the ensuing years, but I wanted to show you the original data to show you how far we have come, because, of course, the official response when this photograph was first presented to the media and to the world was that it was, in fact, a trick of light and shadow. Well, from that has come an investigation, some books, some videos, a lot of discussion, and we are here this afternoon. Now, this is a computer-enhanced version of exactly the same image done 15, 16 years later. Notice the remarkable level of detail, cross lines on the forehead, scalloping on the left side here, the suggestion of teeth in the mouth, deep-set eyes. But again, if we only had one picture, we would never know if, as NASA has said consistently for 16 years, this was merely the most marvelous trick of erosion on the surface of any planet, or, in fact, was something else. For that, you require another set of data, such as this. This is now a second frame taken 35 days after the first frame. And DiPietro and Molinar, two imaging engineers at the Goddard Space Flight Center who got into this very early on in 79 and 80, they were the ones, not NASA, to cull through the 60,000 Viking images in the archives and to find this picture. And when they processed it, lo and behold, this object turned out to be remarkably bilaterally symmetric. Now, we mean by that that it seems to have a left and a right half. There appear to be two eye sockets. The mouth goes through. The hairline appears to go around. There's proportion of symmetry, about 95%. Now, facial expressions we see in mountains or in landscapes here on Earth uh, are inevitably perspective shots, profiles, where if you move 100 meters one way or the other, uh, they go away. What made this different was it was a frontal, full-on facial view as if you were looking at yourself in some kind of cosmic mirror. And maybe that's a telling metaphor for exactly what this was intended to be, if and when we climbed up the ladder to space flight, journeyed across space to Mars, and looked down and saw it staring back. Time will tell. For the last nine years, the argument has raged regarding the reality of this object as a constructed artifact. Well, our focus has now begun to shift. We're looking more at the meaning of this object, including a possible connection with the Earth. The key to our apparently successful solution to the riddle of Sidonia, which is the name of the region on Mars where Viking initially photographed the face, turned out not to be the face at all, but a two-mile-long, half-mile-high, five-sided pyramid located a few miles away. It was Aero Torin, our team member on loan from the Defense Mapping Agency, who cracked the code. Because Torin found, when measuring the internal geometry of the DNM pyramid, that it contains incredible geometric structure, fundamental mathematical constants, which in the universe are the key to signifying the presence of intelligence. This is the Sphinx. We're now looking at a structure, a magnificent, monumental work of art created at a time when nobody else on planet Earth is supposedly able to do anything of that magnitude or scale. There's no other contemporary civilization to pin it on. So who did it? And before you say Martians, just sit there and listen, okay? Okay, I don't want you to leap here. Science has now opened. I mean, rigorous science has opened the doorway to what, in I think it was John's parlance, the dreaded A word, Atlantis. Is it conceivable that the mythos that came down to us through Plato, speaking of a prior high civilization capable of things like this, is maybe 
not a myth. But in fact, we're seeing at least one surviving, albeit very ancient, artifact that you can touch of that halcyon day when we could do things that we no longer can do. Something ineffable brushed an earlier phase of human history and left a monument that recorded in some form the echo of that signal. The basic model of the Sphinx is this lion-man interface. We began to look seriously at the possibility that um, there was more than a passing connection between this awesome structure and the monuments of Mars. Well, take a look. As you progress through the various imaging enhancements, this is high sun now, all right, you can very definitely see that this guy has a simian proto-human look. What you then do is you take the halves, all right, and you fold over. All right, let me go back one. You fold over this half, all right, onto that half so that you can actually get a mirror image, and it's very definitely primitive hominid. It's not Marilyn Monroe or Paul Newman. Why is it primitive hominid? Might it have something to do with how old we think this thing might be? Circa half a million years. Hold that thought. Then what we do is we go back to the original, all right? And we then take the right half and we do the same thing. We fold that over and we get this. And I'm really gratified by your response. That's exactly, that's exactly my feeling. The hair on the back of my neck. When I realized that what we were looking at in the monument of Mars, the face on Mars was the fusion of the hominid and the feline. The fusion of this persona from this, I realized that what we were seeing was, of course, sphinxes, literal embodiments of sphinxes on two worlds linked by the fundamental constants of Sidonia over and over and over again.